right, so we're going to be talking about ultrasound peri arrest because we know that all cardiac arrests are actually true cardiac standstill. And we'll get into that in just a little bit. And here's where we're going for this talk. We're going to be talking about the history of the cardiac arrest because we don't know where we're going unless we look back in time. We're also going to be talking about reversible causes, probably the greatest case for ultrasound. And let me tell you that it's not all glory with ultrasound. There's some pretty important considerations that we have to take in mind when we're talking about ultrasound, but we're going to talk about the things that you can do to make your ultrasound in a code much better. And then, of course, we have to talk about the future of ultrasound in cardiac arrest. So let's take a look back and let's go back to the 1500s when Paracelsius was first doing resuscitation. And basically, people in cardiac arrest, they just stuck a bellows in their mouth and started ventilating. And that was pretty good, but we weren't doing anything for the heart. And so in the 1800s in London, Hall started introducing turning patients on their sides and pushing a bit on their thorax, maybe providing the earliest evidence of cardiac compressions. And then just a couple of years later, Sylvester, also in London, did a modification, laying the patient's flat, moving the arms up and down. But it wasn't until the 1960s when Dr. Saffer and his colleagues started doing what we know today as closed chest com compressions and mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. And although we don't do mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation anymore, we're still doing a lot of the same things, pushing the same medications, using the same electricity, and unfortunately, using the same devices to measure our resuscitative success. This term digitometer is not mine. It's Dr. Joe Belezos, but I think it's such a great term. Are you using a digitometer for your resuscitation? Think about it. We're doing all this stuff for a patient, and in 2023, we're using our fingers to see whether or not we're successful. Now, you might be saying, it's a big deal. ACLS tells us to do it. HA tells us to do it. What's the evidence for using fingers in the code? It's not very good. In a study that took qualified practitioners into the operating room and had patients on cardiopulmonary bypass, they found that only 17% of the sample was perfect, meaning that they accurately detected a pulse or didn't detect a pulse within the 10 seconds that we should be doing a pulse check or a rhythm check. 17% of all the sample, 24 seconds was the amount of time that most of the sample was able to get it right. Way longer or twice as long or 2.5 times as long as what we're supposed to be doing during our rhythm checks. And then there were instances where people said that they didn't feel a pulse when in fact there was a pulse. And there were instances where people said that they felt a pulse when there was no pulse. Bottom line here is that your digitometer is wildly inaccurate and we shouldn't be using it. Now the other way that your digitometers fail you is with this rhythm. What's happening here? It could be one of two things. Now, these are older terms, but terms that we're still using, true PA versus pseudo PA. Are your fingers sensitive to detect whether or not there's cardiac standstill or whether or not there is a heart that's squeezing, but not enough to generate a cardiac impulse? The person on the left is in true cardiac arrest. The person on the right, you can make the argument that this person is in severe cardiogenic shock. The rhythm looks the same and your fingers will also feel the same. So what are we doing here? Now, some people who still are deep into ACLS will say the H's and the T's. H's and T's fix everything. If we're sitting here relaxed at a conference, we probably can come up with the H's and T's together, no problem. The thing is that during a code, it's rarely ever calm. People are throwing things around, there's yelling, there's chaos. And to do H's and T's, you're gonna need to do a good history you're gonna to need to do a physical exam. Most of the time during arrest, this is how people look. They're like, what is going on? So don't think that from an armchair, the H's and the T's can be very helpful in a clinical arena. So the point is that we're going from the 1500s to 1960 to 2023, and are we doing the best things for our patient? Are we doing the best technology, giving our patients the best technology available for our sickest patients. And that's why I'm such a huge proponent for ultrasound and cardiac arrest and peri-arrest, because what we're really looking for here are the reversible causes. So let's take the H's and the T's. Now, looking for acidosis, hypothermia, hypoxia, those are all things that should be in your algorithm. And those are things you can reverse. Ultrasound is helpful for looking at these five things. These are five things that you can't talk through or mentally work through. These are things you actually have to look for. 
And so we're going to go through some clips. This apical four chamber view, you see that there's biventricular. Both ventricles are hyperdynamic, telling you that this person is probably volume down. So if I see this on a code, I'm giving this person volume resuscitation first because they're likely hypovolemic. We can also look at the chest. We can do a fast exam or extended fast exam to the chest. This is a person that was overdosed on Coumadin, bled into their chest, and that's the reason why this person was in cardiac arrest. Found blood in the chest, got blood on board, and got ROSC on this patient. Now, you might be looking at this aorta and saying, that doesn't look too bad. That looks like a normal-sized aorta, except for the fact that's not the aorta. That's the aorta right there. And so what this person has is a ruptured AAA, and there's clot within the lumen there. So another example where you can find a reversible cause for the person's cardiac arrest. We've all seen this before. This is pericardial effusion. This is tamponade. And of all the things that we have in our cardiac arrest armamentarium, or I should say, in our PA algorithm, there are studies that show that tamponade is one of those things that is the most reversible and has the highest chance of ROSC. So I want to know whether or not this person has tamponade right from the jump on my first rhythm check, because there's the best chance of survival for this particular person. And as I said before, when you have a person who you can't detect a pulse on, Maybe the person has severe cardiogenic shock. Maybe this person has a massive MI, and this left ventricle that you see here isn't working so well, and that's why they're not generating a blood pressure and a pulse. I want to know that early so I can start this person on anatropes. Maybe consider extracorporeal ECMO for this person. Clot in transit. Look at this clot right here. If I see that during a code, I'm going to push thrombolytics for that patient. If I have this person, this right ventricle that's blown out, larger than the LV, then I'm going to be thinking that this person needs thrombolytics as well. As well. But I don't want to push thrombolytics blindly. I don't want to consider the H's and the T's tell me that this could be a PE. I'd like some objective evidence to help me get there. Pneumothorax, another thing. Tension pneumothorax is in the algorithm. Are you really going to trust your breath sounds in a noisy room when everyone's yelling and everything's happening? I'll use ultrasound. And as you can see here, the image on the left has a pneumothorax. Image on the right has normal lung sliding. And look, if you can't see lung sliding during code, I get it. I was doing a cardiac arrest last week, and it was very hard to see the lung sliding. But if you see beelines on the lung windows that you're looking at, then that person does not have a pneumothorax there. So you just need to do one point and one point, and you're done. Move on. And you can even do that when chest compressions are happening. Let's talk a little bit about prognosis. Now, maybe you work in a large academic center like this one, where you have an attending someone doing chest compressions, someone who is uh, the charge nurse, you have someone doing airway, and then you have your respiratory therapist, and then you have all these people who are just waiting for something to do. Maybe you work in a center like that. Maybe you work in a center where you only have two or three people who are actively engaged in the code. And perhaps ultrasound can help you to determine prognosis for your patients. Now, this is one of the largest ultrasound studies to date by uh, Romulo Gaspari. And he looked at patients, almost 800 people with non-shockable rhythms who came into an emergency room and they did ultrasound as their initial evaluation during cardiac arrest. And what he found is that for patients who had cardiac activity on their first ultrasound, 4% of those people went on to hospital discharge. Now, I don't know about neurologic outcomes and what happened after that, but 4% is not an insignificant number if you see cardiac activities. And I think something like 15% of those people in that study actually had a pericardial effusion, or I should say the people had pericardial effusion, 15% of those people got it drained and got return of spontaneous circulation and left the hospital. Those are big numbers when you're talking about cardiac arrest. Let's look at the other half of the coin. When you have a person who comes in and they have cardiac standstill, 0.6% left the hospital um, to discharge. So it's not zero as some studies have quoted, but it's not a high number. And so I don't use this in a vacuum. I use this as part of my clinical assessment of the patient. I have an elderly person with unknown downtime that has a lot of comorbidities and we have cardiac standstill. We're going to do the code for a little bit, but if I see standstill, I know the ch per chance of this person surviving hospital discharge is extremely low. I'll use it to make a decision. And if I see somebody young who comes in cardiac arrest and initially had cardiac motion, we're putting all our resources into that person to help them to get to hospital survival because they have a better chance at surviving to discharge. So ultrasound should be used for your reversible causes every single day. Do the H's and T's if you want to be academic, but if you really want to make a difference, use ultrasound. Now, 
I love ultrasound, but I'm going to be honest with you. There are some problems with it, and one of them is the amount of time it takes. So let's get into some of the problems with ultrasound, because I'd be lying to you if I said it's all unicorn and rainbows when we're talking about ultrasound. I have seen and knocked the probe out of people's hands when I see people doing ultrasound on a rhythm like this. Never do an ultrasound, cardiac ultrasound, on somebody who be in a shockable rhythm. Shock that person, get back on the chest. The only thing that should be on that chest are the electrodes that are going to conduct electricity. Don't waste your time with this. And any of you that have done enough resuscitation with ultrasound knows that sometimes there's a little bit too much focus on the screen as someone is looking with ultrasound. There's something magical and mysterious and hypnotizing about looking at that image on the screen and you lose sight of the fact that you really only have 10 seconds or less to get back on the chest because the only thing that changes outcomes in cardiac arrest to this day is high quality CPR and early defibrillation. So is ultrasound a distraction? The problem is that the longer you're off the chest, your coronary perfusion drops. So when you start chest compressions, you start building up that coronary perfusion until you get to a steady state. Every time you stop compressions, you drop that perfusion, and then you got to build it back up again. And so the longer you're off the chest, the less that there's coronary perfusion, and the longer it takes to get back up there. That's the only reason we're doing chest compressions, is for coronary perfusion. So you're actually harming patients the longer and the more frequent you're doing ultrasound. One study with uh, the University of Maryland, this is a good study. They did an observational trial. They just had a camera in their resuscitation bay, and they just observed people that came in with cardiac arrest. And what they found in this observational trial is that when people used ultrasound, the rhythm checks were 21 seconds long. 21 seconds, that's double the time we normally should be doing it. They even found that for people who weren't using ultrasound, it was 13, closer to the normal number, but still too long. So I wanna give you a couple tips that I use in my practice for success that you can still use ultrasound, but be very cognizant of getting back on the chest and doing what's right for the patient. And the first thing is to let the experts do the ultrasound. Now, I'm a teacher, I work in an academic institution. When it comes to cardiac arrest, this is not the time we're gonna start teaching ultrasound to the medical students and the residents and try to find good views. The person with the best experience should be holding the probe and getting the images because you need to be on the chest, makes a good assessment of it, and get off the chest very quickly. So the most experienced person wins the scan. The next thing I like to do is delegate. So I don't like to have the person who's doing the ultrasound doing too many things. Like they should be doing chest compressions and doing ultrasound, then running the code. If you're in a limited shop and that's what you have, I, I respect that. I get it. But if you have many people around, only one person should be doing the ultrasound because there's a lot of things that you'll see that you have to focus on when you're taking care of that patient. I think you also should be scanning during compressions. While there's chest compressions happening, sometimes you can get an apical forward chamber view, but it's not always available. So try to get that apical forward during compressions. But if you can't, do some other things. We already talked about looking for lung sliding. You can look at the lower extremities, the femoral veins here, to see if there's a clot. And the clot increases the likelihood ratio that this person has a massive PE. And maybe this would push you over the edge to give that person thrombolytics. You might scan and see, oh my God, this person has free fluid in their belly right there. Well, maybe this person is hypovolemic and that's the reason why they're in arrest and you're gonna prioritize massive resuscitation for this person with blood and volume. The next thing I like to do is prepare the view. So I like to know where we are in the rhythm check or where we are in the chest compression cycle so I can get the probe ready. I like to start subxiphoid or parasternal, but I'm in the area with the gel on the probe hovering over the area so that the minute chest compression stop, I can get right on the chest, get my images, get off, and let chest compressions happen again. I also tell my charge nurse, I need everyone in the room knows what they have to do during that time because when we get to three, two, one, we're getting off the chest, doing all the other things we're doing, ultrasound and everything else, we're getting back to chest compressions. But I like that auditory feedback from the charge nurse to know where I am, because when I get to three, I'm getting off the chest, whether I got the image or not, I can always get the image on the next round, but it's really important to stay on task here and minimize hands off the chest. Now, what view do you use? I personally like the parasternal long axis view because some of our patient's anatomy doesn't always lend itself to doing a sub xiphoid view. Parasternal long axis view is nice because it's right there up on the chest. Now it is in the way of chest compressions. You do have to clean off the gel, but it is a nice clean view and you get better images, I feel, than the sub xiphoid view for some patients. So give it a try in your next code. I talked about the hypnosis that happens with ultrasound. This is why I take clips. 
I get my view, I identify structures I want, and I just clip, 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 clip. I don't do any interpretations while we're doing the ultrasound. I just take clips, and then after we get back on the chest, I take the machine to the side, and I start reviewing the clips. I'm like, is this RV actually bigger? Is there a pericolor fusion? What do I think over here? I do all my thinking while chest compressions are happening. I'm just collecting my data during that rhythm check. And with that, I don't get caught up in the hypnosis of ultrasound looking at that screen. Have a towel in the other hand, because if you're doing the parasternal logs, you want to wipe down the area so they don't lose traction when they're doing chest compressions on the next round. Minor tip, but I've seen lots of people just slip off the chest during chest compressions with too much gel from the parasternal long axis view. Now, something that'll keep you on task is using protocols. And there have been so many protocols that I've seen during my time with ultrasound, the feel, the fear, the cause, the cure. There's even one called the shock exam. Look. I wish there was a protocol called the Haney exam so I could be legendary and live on forever, but there's not. And that's okay. Pick a protocol that works for you. I like this protocol called the CASA protocol, the cardiac arrest sonographic assessment, because it's easy, it's simple. Tarlin just talked about it and it keeps you on task. Let me go through what this does. On your first rhythm check when you're using Ultron, the first question you should be asking, and maybe the only question, is whether or not there's tamponade. I already told you that this is one of those things when you find arrest. If you find a reversible cause, this has one of the highest rates of survival. So you see tamponade, then you're going to do something about it, get your pericardial CT kit. You don't see tamponade, get back on the chest, and then your second time you're doing your rhythm check with Ultron, you're going to look for RV strain. Now, I will tell you, there's lots of controversy in literature saying that RV strain for cardiac standstill might not be as good as we think it is. But if there's cardiac activity, you see RV strain and maybe some clot and lower DVT, then maybe you're thinking that this person does have a massive PE. For the next step, you're going to look for cardiac motion on your third rhythm check. You're just going to look to see whether or not that heart is beating or not. Because as we said with the Roma Locaspari study, that cardiac motion means something. If I see cardiac activity, I'm going to keep going with my code. If I see standstill, we're going to have to start making some decisions and setting some limits to this code. Now, somewhere in there, based on the clinical context, you're going to have to ask whether or not the person has a tension pneumothorax or whether or not they need a FAST exam. You shouldn't do it for every patient, but if you do have suspicion that the person might have a pneumothorax or blood in the belly, then go ahead and take a look with ultrasound at some point in your resuscitation. The authors of the study left it up to people to decide when. Now, it's not only stuff that you're doing during the rhythm check. You can also be looking with ultrasound for things like the pulse during your rhythm check to make sure that chest compressions are good. And Taryn's going to be getting into that a little bit in his talk, so I won't tread too much on that. People always put the auditory Doppler on the patient. And first of all, it's loud and annoying. I would much rather see color. It's much more quiet. And the information is much more is much more usable to me interested. And again, Taryn will be talking about that shortly. So remember, ultrasound, it's great, but you have to be responsible with it. If I had my choice of doing bad ultrasound or using no ultrasound, I would go with no ultrasound all day long. But there's no reason you have to choose. Just use the tips that I gave you to use ultrasound responsibly as you're resuscitating your patients. Let's quickly go through and talk about what the future holds for ultrasound. Because this is technology that's been around for a long time, can we do things a little bit better during our resuscitations? Now, again, I love ultrasound, but I can understand that there's skin, subcutaneous tissue, bones and lungs to go through. It can be hard to image the heart sometimes, especially intra-arrest. And so I used to think that this quote, the best way to someone's heart is through their stomach was all about food, but it turns out when you trace it back, it's actually about transesophageal echo. And so this device that you see right here is almost like this Indiana Jones type whip, but at the end of it, there are crystals in a linear array that go down into the esophagus right behind the heart. And you can actually turn these crystals in what's called an omniplane up to 180 degrees around and then flex the handle and wiggle it around and bend it so that you get all sorts of different views. It looks like this cartoon. And if you look on the left, this probe is going down the esophagus only millimeters behind the heart versus transthoracic where it's 10, 15 centimeters. You're right up against the heart and you can get almost any image that you want in three dimensions. So it's a much easier view to get. And intra-rest, it is such a wonderful view because you don't have to stop compressions. You can always have your images. So this is how a normal heart looks in transesophageal echo. What we call the omniplane or where those crystals are located, this is in the zero view. And this is called the metasophageal four chamber view. This is like your base view. And if you only had one view, this probably gets you most of the information you need. 
here's your left ventricle, here's your right ventricle, your right atrium, and your left atrium. And you might be saying, Haney, this looks very familiar to me. And you'd be right. This is just a mirror image of your apical four chamber view. And if you think about it, when you're doing apical four chamber, you're doing it from here, now you're doing it from behind. That's why it's a mirror flip. Here's some clips from some of my friends. This is Jimmy Fair, this person interest. Here's the RV. Notice how it's actually beating. So this is a PARS, but the RV is big. This person had a massive PE, received thrombolytics, and actually walked out of the hospital. Here's real Rob Arnfield's clip. This is a clot in transit in the RV. Scary thing to see. But again, this person got thrombolytics and left the hospital. Patrick Oxy sent me this clip. This clip is crazy. So this person was in cardiac arrest. They did the TE and they found a type A dissection right there. Now, this was helpful for the prognostication of this patient because there's no way that this person was getting up to the OR. The, the aneurysm was so big, dissected into the coronaries, they couldn't get Ross back, and this was helpful for them to help terminate the resuscitation earlier than they may have if they didn't have ultrasound available during the resuscitation. Now, one of my pet peeves whenever I watch TV is when I see people say, we're flatlined, shock the patient. And I used to be so upset with it because like, you don't shock flatline, right? That's just not what you do. But TEE has taught me that maybe you should. Because if you look at this clip over here, this was flatline, but it's not flatline. It is fine V-fib. So this person had fine V-fib detected with ultrasound, not with the ECG, and they got shocked. And this person walked out of the hospital. So yes, go ahead and shock a Sicily. And I'd say even if you don't have an ultrasound, go ahead and shock a Sicily. You never know if someone has fine V-fib if you're in the weeds with your arrest. Can ultrasound help you with your compressions? Mike Mallon thinks so, and I agree with him. If you look at this clip right here, we're pushing on the chest where we think we should be pushing on the chest, but look at that LV. That LV is not really getting compressed in an AP manner. It's just getting pushed around. But using ultrasound, you can direct your resuscitation and move the hands around the chest until you get this. Good AP compression, good cardiac output with every chest compression cycle. So I'd rather have the chest compression on the right rather than the left. Is TE faster than doing a rhythm check? Well, it turns out in one study, nine seconds to get your ultrasound view before getting back on the chest. So that's pretty fast, much faster than the other study that we talked about where it was 23 seconds for the rhythm check. So I think that's the future of ultrasound. And every time I do this talk, some of the audience says, I'm emergency medicine or I'm critical care and I can't do a TE. I'm like, okay, so you can put tubes down the trachea, you can put tubes in the chest, you can crack people's chests open, but you can't put an NG tube with some ultrasound jelly on there down into the esophagus to look down. This is something we absolutely can do. And more and more hospital centers are doing this. There are some political components with it. There's certainly a training component with it too. But rest assured, I think that in the next five to 10 years, many more hospitals are going to be using TEEs in your arrest. Now, we talked about a lot of stuff in this talk. We talked about the history. We talked about reversible causes. We talked about technologies. Let me tell you today that the best resuscitative tool that you have is the organ that sits right between your ears. Whatever we talk about today, you still have to integrate clinical knowledge into what you're doing. So I don't want to put any of that, take any of that for granted. You are great clinicians. We're just using the ultrasound as a tool. But when you're talking about what we're using today in the majority of resuscitations, by just using your fingers and going through the H's and the T's, I think we can do better. If we can do surgery with a robot of, and a surgeon across the country doing stuff and all the amazing technologies that we have available for us, why can't we put ultrasound on a person to determine if they have a reversible cause or prognosticate our patients better? I'm, I'm going to put up some social media uh, outlets here for you to contact me on. I encourage you to reach out to me if you want more resources or more information on how to get better at this. I'm going to be running a course this fall. I'll talk about that at the end of this conference where we're gonna be doing some more hands-on training for people from novice to advanced training for bedside echocardiography and ultrasound. But until then, reach out to me on social media. I'm gonna hand it back to Taryn to move on with the rest of this conference. Thank you all for your attention.